main release. Sim feels good, arm switch is coming. Mark. Good light. <laughs> Moments after rocket ignition, the okay. guidance display begins to flicker. 20 seconds. A little right now. The news on the blink. 30 seconds. The right roll trim. Last to Tanu. Wow. With no Tanu to guide his flight, Mike Melville is faced with a hard choice. 40 seconds. Flying blind or aborting the mission. Call oh, heading. Good on heading, roll left. Go, Michael, go. Incredibly, he continues the burn. 50 seconds. 55. Okay, Tanu came back. Copy. Clean shutdown. Doing okay? Doing good. Copy that. 205,000 feet still climbing. 205! Woo! Woo! Very, very dark. Just north of the bullseye, one mile. Okay, feather is out, we're leveling. Copy, he's speaking about 212 and uh, two miles north of the bullseye. Copy. It looks like a big map down there. It looks like looking at a globe. All lit up by the sun. Apogee headed downhill. That's the first hit. But because there's no atmosphere where you are, the lack of atmosphere that you're in is black. It's black as ink. And so that's a very strange thing to see for a normal person or a person who's never been in space. Radar imaging from nearby Edwards Air Force Base captures Spaceship One's feathered shape as it reaches apogee and begins its descent. Now comes the big test. How will the ship hold up as it re-enters the atmosphere in feather at supersonic speed? It's not possible to take a light airplane like this and go that high and come back without a feather. If we get up that high and can't put the feather up, we're dead. Things are gonna burn up like the shuttle did. As soon as it gets in the atmosphere, the tails will turn the nose down and the speed's just gonna go to Mach 4 or whatever, and then it'll get too hot, then the epoxy will melt, things will just come apart. Okay, Mark 1.3. Some fairly low frequency, high amplitude, uh, swinging around a little. The ping pong ball's doing its job. Copy. Okay, we got 32 knots, we're starting to feel the cue. Okay. Okay, Mark 1.9. Two Gs. He dumps the remaining nitrous oxide. Heavy pitching in uh, pitch. Okay. Not much in roll yet. 3G's. 95,000. The remaining dangerous unknown, when the plane slows through the transonic barrier into subsonic speed, 85,000. Passes without incident. 3G's. Through subsonic. Subsonic copy. Still working on the trams. Working on the trams. Typical vibration happening now. The vibrations in the plane increase, but this is familiar territory. Ironically, the heavy vibrations come as a welcome relief. Feather is locked. Everything's green here. Looking out the windows. Unbelievable. You don't even need it to do, you need the ping pong ball. <laughs> <laughs> that was fabulous. Why I would pay a million dollars to do that again. <laughs> Well, luckily, it didn't go out until I had it vertical. Last to the new. By putting my head real straight, staring straight ahead, and looking out of the very corner of my eye, I could see the horizon, and I could see it was black in front. So I knew I'm going up. Follow heading. Good on heading, roll left. Because I wasn't staring at the Tanu, I watched the blue sky just go completely black. Until it was just black. I thought, man, 
In the middle of the day, the sky goes black. You know, how weird is that? Last to to new, to new, to new, to new. I'm looking at video of the motor running and you climbing out of the atmosphere and I'm looking at good data and you said I have no to new and everybody's expecting you to abort. And I says, <laughs> he's going to run it at least 30 seconds. No, and no. then I said, no, he's going to run it at least 40 seconds. And I said, no, he's going to run it all the way. <laughs> Damn right. The lessons from today's flight are what make the next flight possible. The big thing that we learned today is that the ship does re-enter in a carefree mode very well. That was our biggest risk today because we had never been there before. We had only been in that feather mode subsonically. Oh, it was great. Boy, when I put that feather up, I was so glad. Tapestry headed downhill. Here I was spinning around and having a good time. The feather just straightens you right out, sets you down. You hit the atmosphere very softly like a cushion. It's like falling into a feather bed. Next stop, space. After nearly three years of construction and testing, the Spaceship One program is nearing its goal. With tomorrow's flight, Paul Allen, Burt Rutan, and his team at Scaled Composites will attempt to achieve what only three of the most powerful governments in the world have done before them, to put a man in space. Tomorrow, we will attempt to add a new page to the aviation history books. If our attempt is successful, Spaceship One's pilot will become the first civilian pilot to ever cross the boundary of space in a completely privately funded vehicle. For tomorrow's flight, Brian Benny will fly the White Knight. Mike Melville will be at the controls of Spaceship One, and Pete Sebold is Mike's backup. Bert came into my office and put his hand out and said, congratulations. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, uh, you'll be flying the Spaceship One. The envelope expansion for this flight is substantial. Spaceship One will go three times the speed of sound and twice as high as it's gone before to an altitude of 62 miles. In order to reach that height, a new wider nozzle is installed on the motor. Jim Ty came up with another idea to help the plane's aerodynamics. This uh, aft fairing is designed to reduce drag. Uh, drag is the force that the air imparts on the vehicle that slows it down and keeps it from going high. And so by filling in this area with this fairing, the air slows the airplane down less and hopefully goes a little higher. This will be the first time we've flown it. But uh, the computer says it doesn't change the way the airplane flies, it just reduces the drag, so hopefully the computer's right. Otherwise, I might be in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> The population of America's new inland spaceport more than doubles as a windy dusk envelops Mojave. Clearly there is an enormous pin-up hunger to fly in space and not just dream about it. We do want our children to go to the planets. We are willing to seek breakthroughs by taking risks. And if the business as usual space developers continue their decades long pace, they will be gazing from the slow lane as we speed into the new space age. On the eve of this historic first step, Bert's vision for the future seems closer than ever. Just some stuff I've been working on. <laughs> this is an orbital system. If it goes to Earth orbit, it's tier two. If it goes beyond Earth orbit, you know, out to L2 or the moon or Mars or the stars, it's tier three. Anything we do with suborbital is tier one. This looks like a white knight, but it's bigger, much bigger. Seven place spaceship. First of all, you spend a week in space. This spins, this is Von Braun's two tenths of a G. You can exercise by running around this thing. But you have a few hours yourself on your vacation to do a spiritual experience floating inside 